Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March Crane Center Research Forum. My name is Janelle Williamson, and I am the administrative coordinator here at the Crane Center. My colleague Kathy Kupski is monitor monitoring our chat box and will be sending some housekeeping items out here shortly. And we are so excited to have you as our guest and to continue this spring's focus of crane specific research at our forum. And today I am pleased to welcome my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Dorr. Rebecca Dorr is a senior research associate here at Crane and is currently serving as the interim director of research. Her primary research interests are focused on children's engagement with and learning from play, storybooks, and digital media. This line of research explores the role of fiction and media and education with the goal of understanding how we use media to best promote learning in both formal and informal settings. As a de developmental psychologist, she is also broadly interested in early cognitive development, including home and classroom characteristics that influence developmental trajectories and learning, particularly in the domain of language and literacy. Rebecca is here with us today to speak on digital media and young children's learning. So now I will turn my video off and turn it over to our speaker. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Janelle. I'm excited to be here to share with you all today. Um, so I really like this quote that children are in the midst of a vast unplanned experiment when it comes to digital media today. The iPhone was just introduced in 2007 and the iPad was introduced in 2010. Um, and so I wanted to have you all uh, take a minute to think about and share in the chat, um, how have mobile media devices changed your daily lives in the last um, 10 or 15 years? So not necessarily children, but just thinking about as adults, our own lives, um, how, um, what, what, what sort of ways have mobile media devices changed what you do in your daily life and how you interact in the world? Um, if you could drop some of those in the chat, that would be great. I think Janelle's gonna take a look for us um, and maybe read some of them, some of them out. Yeah, we have a few responses already. It says, I have the ability to talk to everybody whenever I want to. My <laughs> does everything. <laughs> Uh, they can be a source of reassurance, communication with out-of-town family and friends, totally connected to work and family, good and bad at times. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so that, <laughs> More sort texting, less talking. that sort of constant connection, being able to talk to anyone at any time and anyone that's at any, any place, yeah, um, across remote distances, for sure. Yeah, we have quite a few coming in. We have access to information immediately, safety, more access and connections, directions. <laughs> I rely on mobile media devices for directions, me too. For sure. Yeah, I really like those inf information. So you're you know, standing in the line at the grocery store and you can look up something that you used to have to wait until you got home at least, if not you know, to call the library or something. Um, and then certainly you know, maps and finding directions to places are you know, pulling out a big map and laying it on your kitchen counter and plotting a direction somewhere, definitely a, a thing of the past for most of us, for sure. Anything else jumping out at you there, Jenna? Um, we just had one, enable me to offer a virtual program of tutoring during the pandemic. Absolutely, and we'll talk about the ways that mobile media devices are um, influencing our lives during the pandemic as well. So those are great. Thank you all for participating in that. So thinking about um, you know, how much mobile media has changed our lives in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been huge changes in children's lives in just this short time period as well. So you can imagine being a child growing up in like the early 2000s before some of these devices were around or available it would be very different from growing up as a child in the 2010s or today. Um, and so now I wanna take a quick poll, if Kathy can pull that up. So what percentage of children under the age of eight do you think have access to a mobile device at home? So this is all US children under eight years of old, under eight years of age and any mobile device. So that could be a tablet of any type um, or a mobile device and not necessarily the child's own device, but just a device that they have access to in the home. That's, um, for the whole family or, or owned by a, a caregiver or a parent. Give those a few minutes to, to come in. Just take your best guess here. All 
All right, might be getting some results here. All right, so we have most people about 48% saying 92%. So it seems like a pretty confident, confident bunch. You guys are all going in that direction. The actual answer is 98%, as we will see um, in some of the data that I'm gonna show here. So good job to those 15% who were, who were correct there at 98%. So first, what, you can, what I want to show you here is this dramatic rise in children's access to mobile devices over the last decade, with 95% of children owning um, or having a device access to a smartphone in the home by 2017. And by 2020, that number was 97% for access to a smartphone. And like I said, 98% for access to any mobile device in the home. So these devices are, are really prevalent, almost ubiquitous in the lives of um, US children today. And then the increase in um, use across this time period is even more dramatic with children's time on mobile devices tripling from 2013 to 2017. And with this increase in mobile devices, there's definitely a lot of societal fear or at least concern around this new media. So I put two quotes up here. Um, one talking about the confusing and harmful abundance of media in children's lives. And one talking about saying that the Pied Piper is back and talking about his cunning witchery. Um, so you can certainly imagine these quotes being about digital media, tablets, um, and mobile devices. But actually, this first one is about books from 1545, and the second one is about the television transmitter from 1951. Um, and this sort of fear of new media um, also came around with both the radio, um, when children were started just starting to listen to radio shows, and with comic books as well. Um, and so the point I want to make here is that there's you know, long been a fear of new or novel media when, they're, when it's first being introduced or first um, reaching a lot of children. Um, so this fear or societal concern around digital media today is really nothing new and goes all the way back to the introduction of books. Um, but when we really think about media and how it might affect children's learning, we wanna think about both the potential disadvantages and the potential advantages of novel media or this new digital media that children have access to today. So thinking about some of the potential dangers of children's um, access to these new media devices for children's learning, one is actually that it's easier to access across time and place, which for a lot of us is, a, is, an, is an advantage, right? We were saying, um, I can get information anywhere I want. I can talk to um, remote family and friends from anywhere I want at any time. Um, but for children, this means that they're likely to be using these mobile devices in the car, in line at the grocery store, um, at a restaurant, things like that, where you wouldn't necessarily have had access to media um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. There's also more solo use of media for young children with these mobile devices. If you think about just sort of the physical affordances of um, using a, sm a smartphone or a tablet, it's um, not, um, it doesn't um, have the same sort of um, mutual or joint media experience that, for example, watching a television um, on a big screen in your living room might have. Instead, children are often on a small screen looking down in their laps. But there are also potential advantages of today's new media. For one, there's the possibility of more interactive content. So the more traditional media like radio and television transmit in one direction, right? So children are on the receiving end of the content. But with these modern digital media devices, the media itself can be interactive to some extent. So these apps and games can respond to children's actions in ways that mediums like, like television just can't. Um, and some researchers have argued that this interactive nature of modern media might actually make it more engaging and potentially easier for children to learn from. And as we've all seen in the last year and was, was mentioned um, in the chat, today's digital media also allow us to extend learning and other activities across remote settings with the use of platforms like YouTube and different types of video chat. 
So obviously there's been a lot of um, in, even in, even more increased societal concern and discussion around children's screen time and media use during the COVID-19 pandemic over the last year. And indeed it does seem like from the data that's coming out so far, children's screen time has increased. Children are using um, more media during these periods of lockdown when they've been out of school um, and when other activities have been closed. And this um, comes out as well in some data that we've collected um, at the Crane Center. This data was collected in Ohio during the early days of the COVID-19 school closings. Um, and we found that media and technology, technology use among kindergartners in a sample, uh, low-income sample, uh, made up over a quarter of their day at about six and a half hours per day in these kindergartners. So, Thinking about the big picture here, we know that people are likely concerned about what effects media and technology have on children's development. And I'm gonna talk about this, um, uh, get at this question in two different parts in this talk today. So first I'm gonna talk about whether media use is associated with development, specifically here focusing on children's language and literacy development. I'll talk about multiple ways we've gone about asking this question and really going beyond that idea of screen of quote unquote screen time um, to think about um, other aspects of children's media use. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll touch on how we can use media in more positive ways to promote children's learning, talking about both an experimental study that we conducted in a preschool classroom, and then um, talking about the feasibility and preliminary impacts of a virtual intervention that we conducted during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but I'll start here with part, part one. So why might we think that media would affect children's language and literacy skills? Well, there's several reasons that you might expect to see this relationship, um, but the primary one that's discussed um, in the literature and supported um, by some research is what we call the displacement hypothesis. And this idea um, of displacement is talking about displacing the time that children might otherwise be, um, children might otherwise spend doing something else. So for example, um, media use, um, children's media use might replace educational activities like storybook reading or parent-child interaction, uh, both of which we know are really important for children's language and literacy growth. But we also wanted to go beyond quantity in this study to look at some characteristics of media use that might affect children's language and literacy skills. And the characteristic I'm going to focus on today is what we call joint media engagement. And joint media engagement occurs when um, children use media with parents or other caregivers when they use it together, when parents or caregivers are asking children questions about the media, talking to them about it, commenting, and potentially scaffolding their learning or their understanding of what's going on in the media content. And the idea here um, in relation to displacement hypothesis is that when parent-child joint media engagement is frequent, children's development may be more positive because the media experience doesn't just replace that contingent, um, that sort of back and forth caregiver child interaction. Instead, it just extends it to a new context. So the way we set about addressing this question was to use some data from a large project um, going on at the Crane Center that's part of the Early Learning Network, um, which is funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. And there were 488 children in first grade that participated in this part of the study. And to all of these children took a standardized um, measure called the Woodcock-Johnson Test of Achievement. And we used two subtests from, uh, from this larger test in the current study. So to measure children's language skills, we used the picture vocabulary subtest. So in this test, children hear a word out loud, and then they have to pick from one of four pictures, which uh, picture represents the word. And then to measure children's literacy skills, we used the letter word identification subtest, where children have to, um, they hear a word out, or they hear a letter out loud, and they have to identify it, or they hear a word and have to identify it. And here we use children's scores on these tests in the spring of their kindergarten year and in the spring of their first grade year. So here we're not just looking at um, what we call correlations. So how these measures um, relate at one point in time, we're actually looking at how um, at children's gains from kindergarten, from the end of kindergarten to the end of first grade. 
then we had caregivers report on children's media use in several different ways, which I'll show you here. So to measure quantity or screen time, we asked parents to report their child's use of two different types of media during different periods of time during the week. So you can see here, we're asking separately about video. Um, and this would be any video that the child watches, including traditional television, um, streaming content like Netflix, as well as short clips, um, such as those on YouTube. And then we're asking separately about that video content compared to apps and games on any type of electronic device. And then we asked about these two types of media use um, on a weekday before school, on a weekday after school, and on a weekend day. And then we took those items and um, created a, a sum total for their weekly media use. And importantly for these school items, this was before the COVID-19 shutdowns when this data was collected. So what, you can, what you're gonna see here is children's weekly media use in hours across the bottom of this graph from zero to 60 hours a week. And then we'll see the number of children going up on that X axis. What you can see here is that there's a lot of variability in how much media children are using across the week. And the average was 23.5 hours a week or over three hours per day. To measure children's joint media engagement, we asked parents um, some questions about how they engage with their children um, and their media. So they responded to these items um, on a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. When my child is using media outside of school, and then we had these different items. So things like, it's usually in the same room as me or another adult. Um, I comment on or ask my child questions about what's happening. Um, or I bring up what they did or saw in other conversations. And then we took this scale and, and created a sum score for children's joint media engagement exposure. Okay, so what did we find? Well, when we're looking at children's language skills, so that picture vocabulary measure, we did find a relationship between children's media use, that quantity variable, and um, their language gains. So here, what we're gonna see is again, those hours of media use per week across the um, bottom of your screen here. And then now we're looking at children's vocabulary skills um, or the gains in their vocabulary skills on that X axis. And what you can see first is that when we're talking about media use that's over about 35 hours a week, you do see this relationship that you might expect where more media use is related to lower gains in children's skills. So if you are using media for more like 60 hours a week, you don't gain as much across that school year as if you were using media for about 35 hours a week, which is about five hours a day. On the other hand, if we look at the rest of this graph, what we see here is that you actually see um, that there's sort of the sweet spot for children's media use, where children who use media for about 30, 35 hours a week are actually um, seeing larger gains in their language skills across this time period compared to children who are using very little media um, at zero, five, 10 hours a week. For children's literacy skills, so identifying letters and words, we found that quantity or that screen time measure didn't actually matter on its own. So that wasn't related to children's literacy gains across the school across that year. But when you consider both how much media children are using and how much joint media engagement they're receiving, you see an interesting pattern. So what we're gonna see here is again, weekly media use across the bottom of your screen. And now we're looking at literacy gains, literacy gains um, on the Y axis. But then we're gonna see these four different panels for different levels of joint media engagement. So in this first panel where it says JME equals zero, that's parents who are doing very little, reported doing very little joint media engagement. They're the lowest end of our scale. And what you can see here is that when joint media engagement is lowest, higher media use is related to lower literacy gains. Um, so for children who, but for children who get more media, joint media engagement, higher media use doesn't seem to matter as much for their literacy skills. So you can see here is as we go up in joint media engagement, that line gets less and less steep, suggesting that it that um, how much media they're using matters less and less. So it seems like by using media with their children and engaging with them around it, um, these parents are alleviating the potential negative effects of high levels of media use on children's literacy skills. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Is media use associated with children's language and literacy gains? 
Well, not in a simplistic way is what these data are telling us. For language, we're seeing that moderate levels of use were associated with higher gains than either low use or high use. So at high levels of media use, this could be that displacement um, coming into effect, right? So children who use media for 60 hours a week don't have as much time for other things like storybook reading or parent-child interaction that we know are associated with higher um, language skills over time. But why would we think that moderate use would be better than uh, low media use? This is not what we expected to see here. We have a couple of hypotheses. One is that um, the Children who are using moderate amounts of media are using media um, that's educational. There is media that has, has been um, designed to be educational and have some language content um, of vocabulary to teach. So children who are using that moderate amount of media might be using those uh, types of media that children who are using less media are missing out on. It's also possible that even if media isn't, the media itself that children are using isn't um, explicitly educational, it could still be exposing them to new vocabulary. So for example, if children are watching a show that takes place in space, they might hear words like spaceship or comet or astronaut that they might not be exposed to in their everyday lives, but that they might um, hear and, and learn from media use, even if it's not intended to be educational. For literacy, we found that media use was negatively related to children's gains, but not when joint media engagement was high. So when joint media engagement was low, media use was negatively related to those gains. And that might be because in this case, media is taking away from those parent-child interactions that would otherwise be occurring if children weren't using media. But when joint media engagement is high, media use may be extending that parent-child interaction to a new context rather than replacing it. And parents who use media with children could be using those opportunities within media to provide practice with literacy skills by watching shows that focus on letters and literacy concepts or by using educational apps. So this study suggests that although high levels of media use and media with uh, low levels of joint media engagement may be associated with some negative effects. Uh, media use is not universally associated with lower skill gains and may even have some positive effects at moderate levels and with adult support. So in the second part here, I'm going to talk about two projects where we started looking at how we can use media in positive ways to promote children's learning and development. So we'll start first thinking about media in uh, preschool classrooms. So we know from recent data that media and technology are increasingly available and being used more and more in early childhood classrooms. And we have some recent data um, collected here in Ohio at the Crane Center from 317 preschool teachers who reported that 63% use tablets on a regular basis with students in their classroom and 47% of teachers reported using tablets with their students at least once a week. And these are all preschool, um, preschool teachers. And of those who reported using tablets, 68% of teachers reported using them for teaching new material, and 82% reported using them to review already learned material with their students. So it seems like teachers in, in early childhood are using these um, digital devices in the classroom for um, intended for educational purposes. But at the same time, there's actually a lack of high quality educational media for preschoolers out there. And there's very little evidence on its use in classrooms, especially for this young age range. So the data I'm gonna show you today was um, part of a larger project where we were creating an intervention to teach low income preschoolers new vocabulary through reading and play. And this was a collaboration with the University and Vanderbilt University. And what we did here was create a mobile vocabulary game in collaboration with an educational app development company called Smarty Pal. And the game included 10 difficult words that we didn't expect um, these young preschoolers to know. And it took about 10 to 12 minutes for children to play through. So the game we created here is about a space adventure and the whole game is in second person. So the child is told you're going to go on a space adventure and they play out the storyline as this um, duck astronaut character you see here. So what you're gonna see on the next slide is clips from when we were initially testing this game in the lab setting. 
and you'll see a child on the right hand side of the screen playing a game and an image of what she's seeing on the tablet on the left hand side of your screen. It's time to go on a space adventure. One afternoon, you are relaxing in your backyard on a hammock. A hammock is a bed made of cloth or rope that you can hang between two trees. Can you say hammock? Hammock. So the game uses all the words in this fashion, uh, showing an image in the context of the story, providing a definition and asking the child to repeat the word, which many of them do, as you saw the child here. Um, and then in the main part of the game, the child has to answer questions using their knowledge of the words to move the game forward um, while interacting with these alien characters that you'll see um, on another planet. So here is a scene from that part of the game. Find a woman lying on her hammock. She'll have the fuel nozzle for you. That's right. You found the woman lying on her hammock, which is a bed made of cloth or rope that you can hang between two trees. Good job. You found the woman lying on her hammock. So after they answer all the questions, um, after you complete your mission, you go back to mission control on Earth and review the words again in the context of reporting on your trip. So to measure children's learning from this game, we gave them what we call a receptive vocabulary test, which is similar to that vocabulary measure we saw in the first study. So children saw four pictures on the screen. They heard a word out loud. In this case, the word is awning, and they had to pick which picture represented an awning from these four. Okay, so like I said, first we tested this uh, game in the lab to see if children would, would learn from it in that setting. We had four-year-olds from middle-income homes come into the lab. 34 children played that game and then immediately took that receptive test with the words from the game. 23 children in a control group came in and they just took the test. We wanted to make sure that children in this age range didn't already know these words, for example. So what you're gonna see here is the control group, those kids that didn't see the game on the left and the game group, the kids who did see the game on the right, and then proportion of the words that they got correct um, going up on the Y axis. You also see this um, line across which represents the chance line. So that's basically um, because there were four response options here, even if children were just guessing, we'd expect that they'd get about 25% correct um, just by chance. So what you can see here is that children in the game group did seem to um, get more of the answers correct on those words than children in the control group. And children in the control group were just about a chance. So it seems like they were just guessing, whereas children in the game group got more words correct than we would expect by chance, showing that, showing that they were learning um, from the game. So now that we know the game is working in the lab, we decided to take it to the preschool classroom. So we had three and four-year-olds in low-income preschools in two cities, and 33 children played the mobile game. Bef they, we had them take a pretest where we tested their, were, their knowledge of these words before they were exposed to the game, and then a post-test where they were um, tested after they were exposed to the words from the game. And they played the game once a week for four weeks in the classroom setting. And they're playing individually, sort of sitting in a corner of the classroom with headphones on. Um, because we didn't have a control group in this case, children who weren't exposed to the game, we also included five what we called no exposure control words. So these were words that were designed to be a similar level of difficulty, similar level of exposure, um, and children were um, tested on these words at the pretest and the post-test, but they um, were not, did not see them in the games. We wouldn't expect them to learn these words across the time period. So what we're going to see here now is those control words on the left-hand side of the screen and those game words on the right-hand side of the screen. And then we're going to see, again, proportion um, of correct that children got going up on the y-axis. And again, that chance line is at 25% because children would get 25% just by guessing. And so what we can see here, going from pre-test to post-test on the game words on the right, children did improve on their um, receptive vocabulary measure. So they seem to be learning words from pre-test to post-test, whereas on those control words, they didn't gain and they were just about at chance. So they were guessing on those as we would expect. 
So I think the study shows that children can learn vocabulary from a well-designed educational mobile game, even in a classroom context, which as you can imagine is probably pretty, um, can be pretty chaotic. There's a lot going on. Um, we did have children sitting in a corner with headphones on, but there's a lot of other things potentially in the classroom to distract them. And they learned even in that context. And they learned even without outside instructions. So these were words that children weren't hearing from their teachers. They weren't hearing um, in any context outside of that game. And importantly, we certainly wouldn't argue that a mobile game should replace what teachers are doing to teach vocabulary in the classroom, whether this is the best way for children to learn vocabulary. Um, instead, I think the study provides evidence for the idea that high quality educational mobile games could provide supplementary instruction to help support children's learning of vocabulary that teachers are also exposing them to in the classroom. And um, vocabulary games could also be recommended for home use, potentially, especially for children who might need um, some kind of extra support for their vocabulary skills at home. Okay. So now I'm gonna to shift to this final project where we were looking at um, a preliminary impacts of this virtual intervention that we conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we all know, around this very time last year, um, lots of plans began to be upended by the ongoing um, pandemic and shutdowns. And this was certainly true for activities here at the Crane Center and our community programs through the Schoenbaum Family Center. So in previous years, um, we'd run a kindergarten readiness program in the summer called Summer Success. And in the summer of 2020, um, COVID-19 prevented the implementation of an in-person summer learning program here and, and likely around the country. And these programs are really important for young children from underserved populations who are entering kindergarten, often with little to no preschool experience. So with um, funding from the city of Columbus and with outreach help from Nationwide Children's, we decided to make a rapid shift to develop and test a virtual kindergarten readiness intervention. Specifically, we really wanted to capitalize on these virtual options to deliver the type of programming that we usually delivered in person. So we wanted to capitalize on what we knew about the potential of educational media so there is a lot of research going back to the early days of Sesame Street, showing that children can learn from high quality educational television um, in certain circumstances. So we really wanted to capitalize on that potential, as well as on the potential of video chat lessons. People talked in the chat about um, being able to engage with um, family and friends remotely across the country during COVID-19. And there's a lot of affordances of video chat that we wanted to take advantage of here um, to teach children um, through this medium, which has been supported by prior research. And we also used a combined approach to target both children and caregivers. So obviously we weren't gonna be on video chat with children for you know, five hours a day, the way we might be in an in-person implementation of a program like this. So we used a combined approach here to target both children and their caregivers to teach children directly, but also to support their caregivers in implementing activities and um, scaffolding their children's learning. And our goal here, because we couldn't have a true experiment, again, where we had a, um, an experimental group that got the intervention and a control group that didn't, here we aim to assess um, feasibility, social validity and preliminary impacts. So feasibility, I mean, could we do this? <laughs> was this even possible? This is the first time that we tried to do something like this at our center virtually. Um, could we do this? Would families participate, et cetera? And then social validity, we wanted to look at what families thought about this. Did parents think that this was working, that it was valuable for their children? And what did teachers think who were implementing this virtual intervention? And then we looked at preliminary impacts, just thinking about our children gaining um, across the time period that they were exposed to this intervention. So we had 91 preschool aged children and their caregivers participate. They are primarily from low SCS background with a median income of $33,000 a year. And they participated in this four week program. And we targeted um, several different skills. First, we targeted social emotional uh, skills. So things like emotion understanding. We targeted three different types of math skills, cardinality, counting, and patterning. And we targeted different literacy skills, things like alphabet knowledge and emergent literacy, like phonological awareness and print knowledge. And families um, received a, a porch drop off of materials for each week of the program. At the first week they received a tablet 
And then every week they received a storybook and then home learning activities that they were supposed to engage in with for that week. And there were five primary ingredients that we considered for this program. First, we had weekly caregiver teacher video chats or phone calls. And this was an opportunity for the teachers, the preschool teachers that we had engaged in this project to um, engage with caregivers directly, discuss the activities that they were supposed to be implementing with their children that week, discuss any challenges that they were coming across, and an opportunity for caregivers to ask questions they might have about their children's kindergarten readiness skills. The second ingredient was two weekly, what we called watch together activities. And these included um, the television episodes that, that parents and children were intended to watch together, as well as an instruction sheet for sort of how they were supposed to scaffold their children's learning from that lesson. So there were a previewing activity to familiarize children with the material, an episode of the educational television show, and suggestions for how caregivers could support children's learning while they were watching and then post viewing discussion points. And we had um, three different educational shows from PBS here. The one that's on the screen is Super Y, which is a show teaching um, literacy skills. We also included um, a math show called Peg Plus Cat and Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which teaches social emotional skills. For the third ingredient, we had two weekly play together activities. These included a game or a playful learning activity for caregivers to do with their children using the provided materials. So for example, um, they might uh, learning activity might be practicing patterns with toy dinosaurs or using music and songs to discuss different emotions that the child might feel. Then we had one or two weekly read together activities where um, we included a pre-reading activity and then suggestions for engaging children during reading and then a post-reading game or discussion points. So for example, caregivers might talk to children about the title and the author of the book, read a book about feelings, and then have children draw a picture of how they feel when they're angry and practice taking deep breaths to calm themselves down. And then the fifth ingredient um, was weekly child teacher video chat lessons. So here, um, teachers engaged the child in a discussion about the educational television show they'd watched that week. They read a book together and then they completed a learning activity supporting the same skill. So during both the reading and the activity, teachers here are using strategies to adjust the lesson to the child's level to provide more or less support or challenge um, as needed. So thinking first about the feasibility and social validity from this project, we easily recruited 100 families um, in just a couple of weeks, and 91% of the uh, families started the program. During, uh, towards the end of the program, we uh, gave a survey out asking parents, our caregivers to rate their program satisfaction. We got 21 responses. And what I want you to see here is the percentage of these high responses. So parents are responding on a one to five scale. And these high responses are the parents that gave it a four or a five. So they're rating very highly things like their experience with the staff and their uh, overall quality of the program. So in addition to these high caregiver ratings for the summer success program, we also had teachers rate children's engagement during the video chat lessons as we weren't sure exactly how this was going to go with having preschoolers engage over video chat. And we found that the average score was a 2.4 out of three for children's um, rated engagement during lessons. This included 53% um, of lessons where children were rated as being engaged for the whole lesson, and 90% of the lessons where children were reported as being engaged for more than half of the lesson. So we considered that a success. Now looking at the preliminary impacts. So again, are children learning? Are they gaining across these time this time period and the skills that we were intending to teach? So here you're gonna see these different skills across the bottom of your screen and their mean score going up on the x-axis and then the pre-test scores in gray and children's post-test scores in red. What you can see here is that children do seem to be gaining on many of the skills that we targeted in this program, including um, significant increases in children's social emotional skills, patterning and alphabet knowledge. So what we saw in this project was that we were able to successfully, successfully capitalize on these virtual options to deliver the, this programming to children and families. 
Importantly, it's unclear which aspects of this program were effective, and it'll be really important for future research to test this type of virtual program in a more rigorous way um, using a control group, for example. But I think this shows evidence of promise for positive use of media and technology under pandemic conditions or for other remote contexts. For example, a virtual intervention could be really beneficial in rural areas where it would be challenging for families to participate in an in-person program or for um, immunocompromised or seriously ill children who might not be able to attend um, something like this in person. Okay, so taking a big step back and thinking about what the takeaways are from what I've uh, talked about today. First, media use in early childhood has changed drastically in the last decade and has actually risen during the recent COVID-19 closures. But this fear of new media is actually not very new. There's been a lot of um, fear and societal concern around any novel media as it comes um, and becomes incorporated into society. But there are potential disadvantages and advantages of this modern digital media technology that children have access to today. What we found in the research I showed you today was that for language and literacy, the relationship is not simple. So some media use may be a positive influence and the context that children are using media in and the content of what they're using likely matter. And when used in purposeful ways, like you saw in the last two studies here, media and technology can support and promote children's learning. So I think the challenge going forward for all of us is to create, implement and test high quality research-based media products and programs that can best support children's learning and development. So I wanna thank um, all of my many collaborators on this work, as well as our funders and partners. Um, and I am open and excited to hear your questions and comments um, in the session now. And then I also have my email on the screen um, if anyone wants to shoot me an email to follow up on anything I've talked about today. All right, so I can that and see what we have in the question and answer session. All right, so it's a question about um, subjects in the study. I'm not sure which study you're referring to, Mary Beth. In the first study where we're looking at language and literacy skills and children's gains, um, those were varied socioeconomic level. So I think that's probably what you were talking about based on the time that you asked your question. Um, let me know if that it doesn't answer your question. There was variability in that first study. Um, let's see, do you have a list of recommended games or shows? Oh, I love Super Y also, Julie. Um, Super Y is a great show. A lot of the PBS shows um, are, are great. So PBS is just a highly recommended source. I'd also recommend Common Sense Media as a good source for um, reviews and recommendations um, for educational media. So those would be my two, two top recommendations, just anything on PBS. And then um, Common Sense Media has a great website that has um, reviews from parents as well as um, expert ratings and reviews. Let's see. Okay, how are control words selected? Did you decide these were similar to target words with regards to difficulty? Yes, absolutely. So we did our best in that study. Um, so that's talking about the study with the digital game where we had control words um, for the children in the second study in the classroom. Um, and those words were selected. They were similar level of difficulty according to several um, established word lists that are used in, in early childhood, as well as um, they were used as frequently in children's everyday conversations according to some large databases. Um, that we have access to of children's language in early childhood. So we did our best to try to try to match those, but um, yeah, good question. Um, let's see. Can learning from mobile games be as effective as teachers' instruction? Do you anticipate expanding the study to compare teachers' instruction? and learning from mobile games or screen videos. I would love to do both of those things. Um, we have not done either of those things yet. We don't know um, how it compares directly to teacher instruction in the larger study. We did have some teacher instruction um, activities. So I said that larger study where the, we use the digital game also included um, uh, 
some other playful learning experiences that children were having. And from the preliminary data from that, it seems like some of those activities where teachers were um, instructing children and using um, games to teach children vocabulary were more effective in the digital game, even though the digital game was effective, um, but we didn't, we weren't able to do a direct comparison. Um, in that study. And the other part of your question, I think, was about um, whether it was an interactive screen versus um, um, versus the game, uh, sorry, the game versus like a, a television show, basically. And I would love to test that. And we haven't been able to do that yet. I think it's a really important question. And the evidence um, from other studies is mixed. Um, we think there's some reason to think that interaction would be better for children's learning, um, but some of the evidence suggests that that might not be true, especially for children of all ages and all um, sort of levels of background knowledge or, or um, skills that they have coming into the experience. I think that's really important to test as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, so a couple um, comments about the types of media that children were exposed to in the, um, I assume people are talking about that first study um, where we just asked parents about children's media use. And yes, what children are watching or playing are very likely to make a significant difference. Um, we weren't able to get at that in the data that we collected here, um, but I think it's a really important question for future research to try to get at what um, the content of what children are watching or using. And I think um, some of our research and the previous research in the literature suggests that um, potentially uh, educational media, the, the more educational media that children use might be related to better outcomes um, for language and literacy skills. I think those are really important questions. Okay, let's see. Stephanie's asking how long is each lesson? And I assume she's referring to based on the time you're asking the question, Stephanie, I guess um, you're referring to the last study, um, the virtual intervention. And those lessons, I believe, took about 15 to 20 minutes on video chat, that video chat instruction with the, um, with the teacher and the child. Um, how much time do parents engage with children on summer success at home? Um, it depends. We don't have great data on, um, parents reporting how much time those interactions took them. I think each of the activities were intended again to take 15 to 20 minutes. So um, it's a, a relatively short period of time in their overall week. Um, but uh, you know, we, we didn't want to ask parents to do too much that wouldn't be feasible, feasible for them to engage with at home with their children with everything else they likely had going on um, during those early days of the pandemic. All right. Let's see what else answered you. Um, Mary Beth, your question about, um, could you state which developmental areas were not impacted by the summer virtual program? Um, we saw small gains across most of our measures that we um, used in this study. The ones that didn't have significant impacts in our, our study were cardinality, so that one-to-one -one, um, counting or counting up skills, um, cardinality counting in general, um, as well as the emergent literacy measure that we used. So all of those I think had um, gain, children gained somewhat, but not significantly across the time period of our study. Um, which could suggest that those are more difficult skills to move um, for children in our sample, um, or that they just needed more exposure. Like we were saying, this was a pretty light touch intervention where we were doing a lot to support families, but then a lot was sort of on their own um, intended for them to implement the intervention as they could in the home environment. Okay. Um, so considering all this information, what would you say to early education teachers when considering using digital media in their lessons? I think that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned before, I think if you're considering using digital media, there's several things to think about. There are several um, sort of rubrics and resources out there from um, NAEYC that has some guidelines about how to use digital media in the classroom, thinking about things that are intended to be educational. Do they align with your curriculum? Are they interactive? Are they things that you can use um, 
to support children's learning as a teacher versus just putting them on something and putting them in, in a corner to engage with it by themselves. Um, and using resources like Common Sense Media, like PBS, to find um, high quality educational media. But I think this is a big challenge for researchers like myself and, and policymakers and, and nonprofit organizations to find ways to support teachers in um, finding high quality educational media because it's not easy and it's a lot of time to ask teachers to engage in on top of their um, already busy jobs um, to ask them to do all this research into finding the best educational media. So um, one, I think recommendation is for um, administrators and coaches to um, provide professional development opportunities to um, support teachers in being able to find educational media and then providing some, ed some educational media um, resources um, so teachers don't have to do that, that hard work of um, trying to find high quality content to use in the classroom. Um, I think it's a great question and we definitely need more research um, on that as well. Um, let's see. I have a question about how was social emotional learning assessed in that last study, um, the virtual intervention study. Um, in this study, we used a measure of emotion knowledge. So first children were um, shown pictures and asked to just um, recognize an emotion. So which picture shows someone who's disgusted, which picture shows someone who's sad, which picture shows someone who's angry. Um, and then the next part of it was more like situations. So they would hear a story about a particular situation, like a child didn't get the present they wanted, how might they feel? And children were asked to show um, which picture represented how the child would feel. Um, so that was sort of the, the measure of emotion knowledge or social emotional learning there. Social emotional learning is a big topic and so there's certainly um, other ways and other aspects of it that you could measure that we weren't able to look at in the study. All right, Janelle, if you're keeping track here, if there's something I'm missing, feel free to jump in. There is one I noticed come in towards the beginning and now I'm have to find it again <laughs> it's uh it asks what uh when when statistics mention screen time does it usually include tv tablets and smartphones or mostly just tablets and smartphones is there a difference and should we think of them separately that's a great question i think when you see something like in popular media when people are talking about quote unquote screen time they're often lumping all those things together um it depends on when the data was collected. If the data was collected, you know, more than 10 years ago, it probably is just TV. Um, but nowadays, um, most of that um, screen time typically um, considers both of those um, categories. And I think um, one thing that's gonna be important for future research is to break those down as well, right? So even in the study that I showed you today, we lumped them all together. Um, but for this idea that these interactive devices might have different effects on children's learning or development, breaking that down and thinking about the different effects that different types of um, you know, mobile media could have is gonna be really important um, as well. Good question. Another one I noticed here was, do you have thoughts about implications for English language learners? That's a great question. There is some limited data that English language learners can learn new vocabulary from digital media, um, from apps and games, but it's a population that isn't nearly as well studied. There's also not as much um, as much content out there, right? Like bilingual content for those learners to help support their learning. Um, so from what we, what we know, it seems like it can be effective for those populations. And it's gonna be really important for researchers to, um, you know, test that in populations where there's enough um, enough of a population of English language learner, learners to see how their um, how media impacts that that population. But I think it's a really important question, and there's there's um there's some preliminary evidence that it that it can be effective in similar ways, at least for vocabulary learning. Hmm. One other question here is, has any of your research analyzed the content of what parents or teachers said during viewings, whether they were explaining, teaching vocab, asking questions, or something else? Are there established measures of quality talk while watching screens? These are wonderful questions. Um, we weren't able to do that in any of the research I talked about today. Um, and there's not much that has done that um, in a sort of a 
natural context, right? So in parents' homes, seeing what they do in a natural setting. Um, a lot of the research that suggests that, that parents can support children's learning in this way is conducted in a more controlled lab setting. So it's not even parents often, it's, it's often researchers um, asking children questions um, or you know, pointing at the screen or commenting on the screen. Um, and showing that that supports children's learning. There's some that, that asks, you know, teaches parents how to do it, um, but there's not a lot that sort of looks at what parents are doing naturally in their everyday environments. Um, and that's something that we would really like to, to get at in some of our, our future research, because I agree it's really important um, to have that, um, to, to know what's happening in those environments. And then also, as you mentioned here, to have a measure of the quality of that, um, of that talk or that engagement with children, um, potentially so that we could then, you know, provide interventions to help families better support their children's learning. So, great question, but I don't have a lot of good data on that, sorry. Yes, um, whoever, whoever that is, that Trouss study, um, Trousseth study, I think is either, either Strauss or Trothis, I think you're combining their names, um, potentially, um, is that study on dialogic co-viewing, um, which is where parents are taught to support their children's um, vocabulary learning from a, uh, from a television show. Um, and they found that the parents who were trained to support their children's learning um, by asking questions about the video that they were watching, where uh, those children learned the vocabulary words better and understood the story better than parents who were not trained in that way, where they just watched the video with their child without that interaction. Yeah, thank you for that citation. Great, and then we have a comment and question from Celia Huffman. She says, I have a PhD in education and tech and literacy. I'm excited about your research. I'm in a public library and coordinate youth education efforts. And it looks like she is, they are asking, um, how, what strategies you use during summer success to increase family engagement and what tool did you use for the video chats with families? Um, we did use Zoom, um, I believe. Um, if uh, I know that Carrie Welch, who was um, on this project, was going to try to jump on um, for this talk. If Carrie, if you want to, uh, if you're here and you want to chat in the comments, feel free to correct me. Um, we did use Zoom. We used a lot of strategies to try to increase family engagement. Um, they had the same teacher the whole time. So there was that sort of one on. They tried to develop that one-on-one -on -one relationship. We did multiple contacts for trying to get them scheduled. We tried to work with their schedules. So we had our poor preschool teachers working crazy hours, trying to get families, you know, at 7, 7 a.m. before they went to work or at 9 p.m. when they came home from work. Um, we tried to be really, really flexible with family schedules. Um, yeah, so that we, I, I'm happy to, to chat with you more if you wanna shoot me an email or connect you um, with some more um, with the, the paper that we're working on um, on, this, on this topic. But it's definitely um, challenging to increase family engagement, especially at this time when um, they were dealing with so much from the, from the pandemic. But um, I'm glad that you're, you're doing your, your great work at the library with the youth tutoring. So thank you for that. Awesome. And then our last question here in the queue is, uh, are there any good sources for mobile games or apps? And you may have answered this earlier. Um, I know you mentioned PBS and Common Sense Media. Yeah. yeah. Recommendations. So Krista, um, Common Sense Media does have recommendations for apps and reviews for apps as well as um, television shows. It might not be quite as robust, but it's there and it's definitely growing. Um, again, as Janelle mentioned, PBS also has some great, great apps. Um, and there is, I think it's the Android store. I'll try to correct, I'm uh, not, not positive on that. One of the one of the big stores now has like a teacher um, teacher approved or something like that label, which seems not perfect, but better than nothing. Um, that that might be helpful um, as sort of a shorthand when when you're trying to choose choose apps or games. But one of the tricky things about this is that there's so many apps out there that are labeled educational, and anything that's on the app store under that education category doesn't necessarily have to have evidence behind it for, for being um, educational. And a lot of them a lot of them don't. So there is um, quite a variety of of uh, you know quality of contents out there. But those are some some resources for to check out.
Well, wonderful. We got through all of the questions just okay. in time. So thanks everyone for coming. And I believe Kathy sent uh, a note that once you exit the survey, you or exit the meeting, you will be directed to a really short survey. So please fill that out and we will see you at our next event.